Good day, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to rant without a plan here for a minute because there's one thought going through my mind. I'm tired of all the negativity and all the end of the world and all of the news cycle stuff. And I'm talking about the church and the world. Now, please, before I continue, this is not a statement about any particular person at all. In fact, I don't have anybody in mind. I'm just, to be honest, as a creative person who writes articles and does videos and things like that, you know, I need inspiration. So often what I'll do is I'll uh, go into, um, you know, Twitter or YouTube or something like that, see what's going on in chat groups and say, is anything kind of going on today that sparks my interest? It's not always news. It doesn't have to be strictly something from, you know, a news media source. But just what's going on that people are thinking about for two reasons. One, it's interesting. Secondly, um, you know, you want to talk about things that are relevant to people because otherwise people just won't tune in. And I was just going through Twitter and I noticed something that's true on both the right and the left. And please, I am not equating the right and the left, and I'm not saying that the answer is somewhere in the squishy middle. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I noticed something that's just really common. Because Pope Francis uh, recently, I guess it was yesterday or probably today with the time difference, I guess they're ahead of me in time in, in Portugal. You know, he gave some interview, and it was released in some Spanish paper, and I was reading through it. And basically, you know, Pope Francis was saying this and that about traditionalists and, you know, he worries about kids who get um, mixed up with these traditional groups because they're weird and they have weird ideologies and things and he doesn't want priests that are rigid, you know, the whole thing that you see, you know. And it was fascinating because there were some who were like the sort of intellectual or, or I guess left wing, I should say, uh, left wing media and Catholicism. Who are like, this is amazing. He's the greatest pope ever. Yeah, those those traditionalists are a bunch of weirdos. And then on the other side, there was sort of the right wing reaction, which was, you know, uh, what kind of what kind of crazy statement is this? I mean, does Pope Francis know anything about traditionalists? You know, what a what a destroyer of the church, and blah, blah, blah. And to be honest, I obviously sympathize with the right wing statement. <laughs> it's it's been pretty hard under Pope Francis. But I realized none of this dialectic. None of this dialectic between the right and the left is going to help anything. That doesn't mean that news organizations should not do their job. Again, I'm not saying, you know, swear off the news, or I'm not talking about any particular individual or show, or that's not what I'm doing at all. I'm just noticing that we're in this never-ending feedback loop where, whether it's in politics or in the church, there are the enemies of tradition, the enemies of Christ and so forth, who are doing obviously bad things, and the people who support the destruction of the church or society are applauding those things, and the people who want to defend the church and society against those things are, say, are calling foul on those things. And what you basically have is this back and forth, this war of headlines and videos and, you know, opinions and so forth to try to say, you know, here's why the prime minister, here's why the president, here's why the pope, here's why so-and-so is, you know, just completely wrong. He's a big mini poo poo head, and here's the truth. And granted, I sympathize with that point of view. I am a traditionalist. I have worked in the news industry. I am a conservative, all those things. Yes, I agree with the rationale behind the assessments. On the other hand, you have the left-wing types, as I said, who are saying, look at all these crazy trads. See, Pope Francis gives one critique about them and blah, blah, blah. They react like a bunch of weirdos. Pope Francis was right. It's never going to stop. It's never going to stop unless we go to the heart of things. And the way that we get to the heart of the problem is we have to revive a deep love for truth, goodness, and beauty. You know, one of my favorite Twitter accounts to follow is the gentleman, his name is Adam Minahan. I know nothing about him at all, except that he does that podcast. I think it's called The Catholic Man Show. I don't think I'll be invited as a guest anytime soon on The Catholic Man Show. It does seem to be a pretty mainstream diocesan thing. 
but I'm just talking about his Twitter account. His Twitter account, pretty much every day, he is posting pictures of his children, going fishing, reading uh, Plato, Aristotle, Aquinas, the, the Iliad, the Odyssey. I mean, he's just, you know, it, it seems like he's the kind of guy who follows a rule of life. And he does work in media in a sense, but he avoids polemics, he avoids whatever, and he just wants to do things that are edifying for Catholic men. I think that's wonderful. Again, I don't know anything about all his positions of someone saying, well, once I heard Adam Minahan say this and that. Okay, well, I haven't. I'm just saying I love interacting with the guy on Twitter, um, and I love the stuff he posts. It's just, here's what I'm reading. Here's this great book by a saint or a church father. Here's some more stuff on philosophy, and here's a cup of coffee, and, and, and you know, this is what nature looks like. I just think it's wonderful. And again, I'm not saying that there's no need to be informed. Everyone is informed in some way. You know, obviously we have to know to a degree kind of what's going on. I get that. I'm not saying we should shut down the news industry of, you know, being informed and knowing the truth. We are in an info war, to borrow a term from the infamous Alex Jones. We are in a war of information, and we always have been. I mean, the war of information started in the Garden of Eden. Satan gave different information than God, and he packaged it in a way where it was half truth, half lie, and it was part of the downfall of the human race. The info war is real, I'm not denying it. But how many hours are in a day? 24? How many of those do you sleep? between six and eight, how many hours do you spend working? Let's just say, let's, let's call it eight hours of a job. Let's add an hour for travel time. Um, so let's just say, you know, nine hours of your day minimum is relegated to working. Okay, well, you're leaving at 8.30 in the morning, you're getting home at 5.30. Okay, you're up at seven in the morning, so you're awake at your house for an hour and a half. You see your children for an hour, maybe. You get home, 5.30, hustle and bustle of getting home. You have supper. Your kids are in bed by 8.30 or 9. I mean, you see your kids for five, four hours a day, if you're a father especially, four or five hours a day. And how much time do you have with your wife? You know, you can see where I'm going with this. There's only so many hours in a day. And why would we spend so much of it? Feeding this negative negativity beast. It's just, it's insane. Like, I mean, I guess if I could offer a critique to my traditionalist friends out there, there is a temptation when you recognize the crisis in the church. There is a temptation when you recognize, you know, the crisis in society. Okay, fine. You know, you realize that the French Revolution was really bad. And the communists kind of sprang from there. And, you know, you, you follow the things and you're informed, you know, you know, it's there. But then it's like your whole existence is how do I find out more and more and more and more about just how bad things are? You have to understand that is spiritually murderous. It will damn your soul. If you're not careful, you're going to despair. You're going to sin because you're going to be, you know, when you, when you consistently involve yourself in the negative feedback loop, whether this is on the left or the right, because one thing I've noticed is that this dialectic between the right wing and the left wing, again, I'm a right winger. The left is wrong. I'm just saying I'm talking about the presentation thereof. If you look at the left wing, they're always worried about the apocalypse. It's always the apocalypse right? It's climate change apocalypse, COVID apocalypse, mega Trump supporters are all going to come into our homes and kill us, kill all the black people, you know? Like, there's always an apocalypse happening to the left. They are complete merchants of fear and scandal. It's tabloids, it's, you know, gossip about this or that celebrity, it's, you know, talking about how right-wingers are undoing the very fabric of free thought and civilization and they want to throw women in cages and make them have babies. I mean, it's just a stupid, 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 moronic, imbecilic, intellectual wasteland on the left. 
But on the right, on the traditional side, the conservative side, yes, generally speaking, we're correct about the information. We were correct about all the things that you got censored off of YouTube for. That's why they were censoring us. We were correct. But just because you've investigated all the possible true information doesn't mean you're going to be happier. It doesn't mean you're going to be holier. It doesn't mean you're going to be in a good mood. And on the left, again, they live in a fantasy land where the apocalypse is now. And that makes you act crazy. On the right, we live in a land, it's not fantasy. The, again, we're correct. But nonetheless, it's still the same mentality of apocalypse is now. And that also makes you act crazy. You're a human being. You know, think about this. Uh, if you've ever had children, especially if you've had your first child, okay? I don't care if you are a trad, if you are non-religious, if you are conservative, I, whatever. If you've never had a child, you could grow up in the best home possible, you know, where you grew up with like 10 brothers and sisters. That'll definitely help. But, you know, no matter where you're from, when you have your first child and the baby's crying all night and, you know, in my case, my wife had a C-section, whatever, you get in that position where for the first time in your life, you really are sleep deprived. You really are dealing with nerves. Your nerves are shot and stuff. You realize that, you know, you've got to figure out how to get through that because you're kind of on the edge and you'll know in a married life, things get difficult in that first bit and you got to figure it out and you, and you do and it's fine. Everyone goes through it. But I'm using this analogy to say, when your nerves are shot, you are completely vulnerable. You're more emotional. You're less stable. You're less rational. I don't care if you're right wing or left wing. If, you're, if your nerves are shot, you will be unstable. If you're unstable, you can't make correct decisions. So, again, are we correct on the right wing? Yeah, we are. But if your nerves are shot because you're constantly looking at the next headline, constantly finding terrible statements that Pope Francis has made or whatever, and you're constantly feeding this negative emotion, you start to manifest the characteristics that people have as addicts. And I've seen this kind of watching over the years in social media and watching, and I've seen it in myself. I mean, we all, you know, we all can, we have to be careful about these, these things that happen. And I've seen it where... Again, even though the right wing is correct, people can still be so out of touch with what's important. You know, I was, I'm reading this book right now. This book, I have the dust jacket off, off. It's called The Great Facade. It's a classic work written by um, uh, Chris Ferrara and Thomas Woods. It's a wonderful book. I'm, I don't know, 200 pages in. Started reading a couple days ago, three, four days ago. and um, it was first written in 2002, and it was re-released, I think, in 2015 or 2016, the second edition. So here's the crux of the book. The Great Facade is about basically the Second Vatican Council and what happened after. This, as far as I'm concerned, is the best like, single volume that I think any person, whether traditional Catholic or not, should read to get the traditional opinion about the Second Vatican Council and what happened after. And the reason I say that, it's, it's not even really polemical. It's just completely well-sourced. Uh, Ferrara and Woods are both eminent scholars in their own right. Ferrara, an amazing lawyer. Thomas Woods is an you know, amazing historian, you know, his training in that. It's incredibly sourced. And the, the reason I'm bringing this up is because this book was, I haven't even got to the part in the book that is post-2015. I'm reading what was written in 2002 or by 2002. And I'm reading this and I realized a couple things. For one, I could read just that book, just that book. And from a theological perspective, from a perspective of what's happening in the church, why is there so much doctrinal confusion? Why do people critique the Second Vatican Council? All the major points you would need to understand the traditional position. I would never have to read another book. I'm just being honest with myself. Like, do I, reading this book, does this book satisfy the need to understand 
what has happened in the church since the council and what is traditional Catholicism talking about? Yes, it does. I mean, sure, I'm sure there are things that critics could say, well, they could have done this. Sure, I'm just saying in a finite world where you sleep eight hours a night and you work for nine hours a day and you spend five hours with your family, there's only so much time in the day, you could read this book and that's literally all you'd ever have to read. And it kind of dawned on me, thinking to myself, this, book's is, this book is sufficient. This book is sufficient for explaining what's going on as far as the mentality to be convinced of the traditional Catholic position. But I, like everyone, will finish this book and I'll probably think to myself, I need to get my hands on something else like that. Why? There's no need to. I've, I read this book and... Of course, I'm reading this book as someone, I literally wrote a book about the SSPX and Archbishop Lefebvre, um, which you can, of course, find in the description to this video. I can put that on screen here. Um, so yes, I've done a lot of research myself, so I'm, I'm going through the book a little bit easier and faster because a lot of it, I'm like, okay, I knew that, I didn't know that, I'm making connections, fine. My point is, is you would literally never have to read another book about the traditional Catholic thing. And this is one of them. You could pick up other ones, I'm sure, and you would never have to read another thing. I've heard Roberto De Matteis is pretty good as well. I've never read it, but I've heard it's great. But people are going to still, every day of their life, say, what next thing do I need so I can understand the crisis in the church better and better and better? There is, I mean, there's a limit. There's a limit. The real question we should be asking ourselves is, what book should I be reading to save my soul? What podcast should I be listening to that offers a benefit to my life? Does it offer a benefit to your life to be always ticked off? And I'm a podcaster. I hope that what I do is useful. And I don't know if you've noticed on my channel, in the past few months, I've kind of started talking about the crisis in the church less. I'm, I'm not... Not, not, uh, uh, I haven't stopped talking about it, but I've tried to start offering thoughts on things that are more lasting. You know, for example, I've had this gentleman on my show, Lloyd, kind of talking about the history of Islam, the history of Freemasonry sort of thing. I've been sort of doing more essay-type conversations about things I think are useful. Um, you know, I, I've been trying to change the way that I do some of my YouTube stuff, because I realized if I feed the beast, then I'm a hypocrite. Again, there is need at times to be informed on certain things. I get it. But if you think about all the time you spend on the internet, how much of it is there to just make you angry? How much of it is there to Make your nerves shot. And then how unstable are you after that? Are you sleeping better from all the time you spend online? Do you really need to read another critique of Vatican II's problem with li religious liberty? You know, it's pretty obvious once you see it. It's like, then you're done. You, you get it. Now, there is a temptation. There is a, there is a temptation to go too far in the other direction where you say, well, because there's so much negativity, finding out all these things that are true, I'm just going to embrace the fantasy land. That's kind of like the story of the Matrix, you know? Uh, you know, Neo is told that, well, not Neo, one of the guys is basically told he can go back into the Matrix and have a great life and doesn't have to fight anymore. And his, his line is basically, you know what, I don't care, ignorance is bliss. You know, I just want to go back into fantasy land. We shouldn't do that, of course. That's a, that's a story as old as time. That's Plato's allegory of the cave, basically. And the second thing I wanted to mention when I said there was going to be two things about that book, Great Facade. Another thing I've learned in this book, and I'll just read some of the titles here. So the first thing is the problem of novelty, viruses in the body of Christ, liturgical minimalism, making a virtue out of doing nothing, the charge of integrism, which is basically like saying rad trad, the charge of private judgment the idea of pitting one pope against another, the idea that traditionalists are schismatics, not just in the SSPX, um, and, and so forth. And 
when I realized as I'm reading through this, this book is, it was based on, there was a pamphlet put out by a Catholic newspaper basically saying why traditionalists are nuts. And they used that pamphlet, which has kind of gone to the dustbin of history because it was so ridiculous, but they've used that as their inspiration for sort of the, the scaffolding for the book because it was the, the, pa- the pamphlet was so ridiculous in talking points by the sort of neoconservative anti-traditionalist crowd that it was a perfect launching pad for just debunking the whole narrative against traditionalists. It was genius what the authors of this book did. But I realized they're writing this in 2001, 2022, or 2002. And the same accusations are being thrown at traditionalists that were thrown at traditionalists 21 years ago. Even though things have gotten infinitely better for tradition in the church, even though traditional orders have grown, even though more and more people flock to tradition, even though the position of the SSPX, for example, has become more clear to people with Pope Francis, ironically, you know, all these things, even though things are way better than they were then in one sense, the same accusations are thrown. And I realized it was a big aha moment for me. And I realized just to get back to this main point, nothing is new under the sun. You know, we see this in scriptures. I could search the internet and I could look at so-and-so's stupid podcast and -and so-and-so's stupid podcast and stupid so-and-so's really stupid so-and-so podcast. And that's anti-traditionalist and it's going to say the same things. You know, you're a schismatic. You don't believe in this, blah, 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 blah. You reject this. And I'm like, oh my goodness, you're not even original. You're not even original. And why would I waste my time with that? Why would you waste your time? And that made me think even further. Well, if everything's basically already been said, then why waste my time on the things that have been said that are useless and have been roundly debunked? And why don't I just spend my time in truth, goodness, and beauty? I want to leave here with a challenge for everyone watching this. We live in an age where you can access everything you could ever think of on the internet. PDFs of books, whatever. We live in an age where printing prices are so low that you can buy you, know, you can check out a website called Thrift Books. It's basically used books. You can go down to your local mission thrift store or whatever it is, and you can find amazing books that are everywhere, that are just like the classics of philosophy, of history, of church history, of theology, whatever. You can find them everywhere. You could go to a local, you know, St. Vincent de Paul and find five or six copies of St. Augustine's Confession in four different translations. I know it's not Lent, So we're not really in a penitential time. But I'm just going to challenge you. Even if you stop listening to my podcast, great. Get out of the feedback loop. Get into the great books. If you're going to listen to stuff, listen to good audio books. Listen to classical music. Listen to sermons. There's plenty of sermons from traditional priests online. Listen to sermons. And stop destroying your nerves and stop feeding yourself the vitriol and the negativity. It's going to do nothing to save your soul. I don't know. If we don't fix the interior problem and, and a uh, granted, granted the Novus Ordo left-wing kind of contingency of the church, there's an aspect of quietism, which is wrong, which has been condemned by the church. This idea that basically we just don't do anything. We only worry about you know, our personal belief about God and everything will be fine. Well, no, we always have to do, we have faith and works. We got to do things. I'm not saying go be like, you know, don't pretend you're a monk when really you have to run a business. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that I think if you do a little inventory of your life, you'll find that you've wasted, I know I have, Thousands of hours over the past however many years trying to understand things about this or that and the church and society. And those hours greatly outweigh 
the time you've spent reading the great books, listening to the great lectures and sermons that actually feed your soul. And if, if we do believe there is a crisis in the church, which there is, if we do believe that there's an attack on tradition, which there is, then we have to personally become saints. And I know that's such a cliche. You hear that all the time. But we have to become saints. To finish off here with Archbishop Lefebvre, which you can see right there, you know, it's funny. I've been talking to a friend of mine who's a traditionalist but doesn't really know anything about the SSPX. And we've been talking, and uh, he said, I'm so surprised, Kennedy, at how moderate your positions are because there's this impression that, you know, the SSPX, you know, whatever, it's all this crazy rad trad, whatever. That's the narrative. Even amongst traditional circles, a lot of the traditional orders have said sadly unkind things about the SSPX, whatever. But I said, no one understands Archbishop Lefebvre because no one re I told this, told this guy, I said, no one understands Archbishop Lefebvre. No one reads Archbishop Lefebvre. The vast majority of the things he ever wrote or said in his life were just about spirituality, forming priests, holiness. He was thrust into a position where you know, the rest is history, and, and he, was, he was unique in his, in his uh, defense of tradition, and he was the guy. And he was put in that position where he now had to get into this crazy world of canonical politics and all this kind of stuff. That was never his intention. You know, you read um, his spiritual conferences, and you read his, his book at the end of his life. He wrote my, this, The Spiritual Journey, it's called. It. Either My Spiritual Journey or The Spiritual Journey. I've read it. It's on my nightstand. It's a great one. It was written for priests, but it, the funny thing is it's written for priests who are going to be entering a very rigorous traditional seminary, but it's like 80 pages and you can pick it up as a layman and understand it perfectly. You know, for example, one of the parts in the book, he comes to the idea of creation and Genesis, you know, and he basically mentions, you know, well, people, how do they interpret that these days? He, literally, he just says, this is the scriptures. We just, we, 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 we believe these with simple faith. He's just like, God wrote it and we just believe it with simple faith. I mean, there's, it's, there's so much wisdom in there. And he said, the perfect thing without having to go down all these rabbit holes of, you know, 750 pages of philosophy is like, these are the scriptures. The saints believe them. The fathers of the church believe them. Are there debates about this? Sure. So we just believe them with simple faith. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Get out of the feedback loop. Find your interior peace and search for the truth, goodness, and beauty in the Catholic tradition. As always, please let me know what you think of the comments. This has been the Kennedy Report. Until next time, God bless.